So this is the lock that I chose to discuss today. It's unusual in that it's a spring-loaded two-bolt lock that has tumblers. Uh, and in my experience, I have not seen many spring-bolted locks with tumblers. Uh, that doubles the security of the lock, uh, but it does add some, some problems that we'll talk about along the way. It has flat coil springs, uh, on one for each bolt and one for each tumbler, so there are four coil springs. It has a fairly complex ward box, uh, which is a, about the height of this style. Uh, this style would be on the inside of an exterior door and all the parts would be exposed to the inside of the building. The bolts on the inside would be drawn back by hand after separating the tumblers by hand. When you have a lock that has a pin in the center of the ward box over which the key has to fit, you can only enter that ward box from one side, which would be the outside. Take the next. So this is the view you would see if you were looking down on the lock on the inside of the door. What is on the bottom now would be secured to the base of the door. The bolts are angled so that they strike the keeper on the door jam and are forced back. And here's our problem for this lock. The tumblers prevent the bolts from moving unless the tumblers are open. So in closing this door from the inside, one would have to separate the tumblers with the hand and push the door closed when the bolts contact the keeper on the door jam, the bolts would slide back and then snap into place. So you can see the two tabs on the tumblers. Uh, you can see just below those, there's a little lug on the bolt right there that Josh is indicating. It traps that bolt between the front staple and the tumbler. The scrolls that you see standing up very high are what you would use by hand to draw the bolt back. The next slide then will show the, what you'd see if you were looking at the lock from below. And you can see how complex this ward box is. There are three ward plates attached to the left. When you have a spring-loaded bolt, the key does not make a full revolution. So the key would draw the bolts back and then the key would reverse itself as the bolts slide forward. Uh, the pin it reaches into the door so that the key fits over the pin and then is guided into the lock. The pin also supports the key in its rotation, so that it's a uh, a nice way of having the lock support uh, the key supported within the lock. Next slide. I, I've traced one of the photographs of the lock, and then I have marked different elements of the lock in red. So here we have highlighted the bolts. And the dark red item in the center would be the talon fastened to the upper bolt. That reaches down into the ward box below so that the key strikes it to draw the bolt back. Uh, there's another talon that I imagine is pinned to the lower bolt that would not show in any of the photographs because it's behind too many things. But the, he would strike both talons at the same time to draw the bolts back. Next slide. So here are highlighted are what I'm calling on the left, the rear staple. In, in the middle is a cover of one of the springs that then has a retainer that keeps the tumblers in line. And on the far right is the front staple. And this table has an added section in the middle that I believe was designed to protect the fingers when you hold the tumblers open and close the door, moving the bolts back, the fingers don't get hit by the lugs on the sides of the bolts, nor would they get pinched when the bolts go forward again. Next slide. Shows the, the tumblers are highlighted. The one on the top has an arm that reaches into the ward box that's lifted by a key and it pivots on the far left. The one on the bottom has an arm that reaches into the ward box also, but because the key is gonna lift things, the pivot is in the center so that when the key lifts the arm on the lower tumbler, the end of the tumbler that retains the bolt is lowered. 
So when the key strikes these, as we'll see in the video later on, the upper tumbler rises and the lower tumbler lowers, uh, disengaging the lugs on the bolts. Next slide. The springs are covered on this lock. On some of the simpler ones, they're left open. Uh, they're always rolled so that compressing the spring tightens it on the square post that retains the spring in position. Uh, the two in the back press on the bolts and the two in the front press on the tumblers. Next slide. Is the ward box here is colored in red. This is a highly refined version of a simple type of ward box. I'll show some slides of some other simpler locks in which ward boxes very much like this have feet. This one has a plate on the bottom. It was necessary because the ward was attached to that bottom plate. I, I believe that this ward box was made in a different shop and then uh, inserted into this lock, uh, mainly because the, the ward box is so simple it's in decoration, it's complex in the wards, and the rest of the lock has a lot of file embellishment upon it. Uh, so the style doesn't match entirely. Uh, there's a, another lock that we have a picture of here. It's a very similar, it must have been made in the same shop. It also has file embellishment on all the elements except for the ward box and the ward box is similar as well. Next slide. So here's a very simple spring-loaded lock. Um, I don't know if everybody's seeing the same thing I'm seeing. The end of the bolt is covered by some of the pictures on the right. But the end of the bolt on this lock is square. This lock would be operated on the inside by the handle to the left. You can see the spring, the flat coil spring is open. And I think these were covered on some just because they often don't come out perfectly symmetrical. And by covering those, they tidy up the look a little bit. Uh, the bolt has a talon. And you can see, looking at this one in the center, why it might be called a and it looks a little bit like a claw it, that would be reaching into the ward box and contacted by the key as it rotates. Because this is a spring-loaded lock, the ward box is made asymmetrical because the key doesn't make a full revolution. The pin on the ward box, the center pin, is a T-shaped forging. But, uh, that's all one piece. So this on this slide, you can see one that I made. So the ward box would have a hole through which the pin protrudes, and then two holes that have uh, countersunk rivets that hold it in place. This is the strongest way of fastening the pin. Uh, on the cheaper locks, the pin would have a tenon on one end, and those frequently loosen up, or it would have an L-shaped pin. But the T-shape is, is the nicest. And quite often, they decorate the key-headed the T head of the pin. Next slide. So here is a spring loaded lock that has two bolts. This one takes a solid key. The key is in the ward box. You can see the tip of the key stem protruding through the hole in the ward box, which is what uh, centers the key in the ward box. So it's not centered, but it guides its rotation. Uh, the ends of the lock in this case are square again, so that when you close the door from the inside, you have to draw the bolts back. When you close the door from the outside, you use your key to pull the door and to draw the bolts back to close it. Uh, an interesting thing about this one is that they have extended the reach of the springs. Um, in the back there, the springs are both covered. They cross each other so that the one the spring on the upper side pushes on the lower bolt and the spring on the lower side pushes on the upper bolt. The, the longer the spring is, the less any one part of the spring has to bend, and so the, the less critical the hardening and tempering is. Next slide. So this one is the first of the slides we have here that shows a pair of bolts with angled ends. So the advantage of this is that when you close the door from the inside, you don't have to draw the bolts back. The bolts strike against the keeper on the door jam, which would be angled also. That forces the bolts back, and then they snap into the opening below the keeper, 
to lock the door. So this kind of lock, I think, was popular because you did not have to have a latch as well. You could use the lock to hold the door closed. You'd have to have your key. If you close that door from the outside, it locks until you need your key to get back in. You don't need the key to draw the bolts back. If you have a handle on the door, you could just pull the door closed and it would lock. On this one, you can see the ward box has two small feet that are riveted to the back plate, and there's some file work on the T pin in the center. You can't see the rivet heads because they've been countersunk and filed flush. Next slide. This is a, a lock that I own. All the others so far have been in the Best Rhyme collection. This is a lock that is a very simple head bolt. The bolt is not spring loaded. The spring you see at the top presses down the tumbler. So that tumbler holds the bolt in place. Uh, when you have two bolts, the key has to strike two different things in the ward box. And when you have a bolt and a tumbler, you have to strike two different things in the ward box. So that the tumbler is added protection. Uh, our main lock in this discussion has two bolts and two tumblers, so the key has to strike four different things in the ward box. Next. I believe the next is a video of this lock working. So the key from the outside strikes the tumbler first, which raises the tumbler away from the shoulder at the back of the bolt. There is a small shoulder in the front of the bolt, not as large as a spring-loaded lock, because you don't need to resist the forward thrust, but you do have to stop the forward motion. So that lifts the tumbler out of the way. The tumbler falls again on the far side of that little shoulder. It provides a slight amount of friction to prevent the bolt from uh, swinging forward when the door is closed. So this lock requires that you have the key to lock it and, and unlock it. This lock was sent to me, uh, the photograph of this lock was sent to me when I first started promoting this uh, discussion by Lou Zapovich, uh, excuse me, John Kupazovich, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, this is a very similar lock to the one that the Vestrheim owns, and this lock has its key, so we can show the lock working. Uh, there are a few differences. The rear staple has its connection on the bottom instead of the top, and there's an arm on the cover of the spring for the lower tumbler. If you can see the tumblers pulling out of the way and the bolts are tracking, you can see the little lugs on the bolts that are held in place by the tumblers. This video shows the lock entering the, or the, excuse me, the key entering the ward box on the pin. You can see the key has been cut to fit around those wards. All those wards run the complete um, distance around the center pin. Sometimes you see just little fingers, but these are concentric rings that give the most protection. Go to the next slide. This is the key that goes with that lock. And I've got another lock that's more complex that has a key that's very similar. Uh, so the warding is complex, but it's uh, not really that difficult. It's a series of the same thing repeated. There are two ward plates, and each one has either one ring ward on it or two ring wards. And by combining these, uh, the result is that there's no straight access from the center of the keyhole to the boards and the talons on the bolts. Next slide. So this, this is a slide we saw before. So this is one version of the spring-loaded bolt, two bolts, no tumblers. And at the opposite end is the next slide. which shows 
the uh, the next step in uh, the development of the locks. Here, most of the works are covered, but the cover has been pierced. This, I believe, is a spring-loaded lock. I've never seen this lock. I found the picture on the internet. But why I chose this one is that the key is so similar. But the ward box is a much more complex uh, construction. Uh, this, this ward box is a style that, uh, in its height of development, was built to accept tubular keys with tubes that were other than round. You could have different profiles that would fit into a profile tube around the center pin that would rotate along with the key. What you see across from the key on the far left is a handle that comes from the outside. So this lock has a latch that's separate from the lock. In many locks of this style, there is a, a function that allows you to lock the spring-loaded bolts in the unlocked position. So you can just use the latch and open and close the door without having it locked. Uh, the board box is the octagonal piece on the bottom. Above that, toward the top of the lock, is a square hole through which the pin on the outside handle would protrude, and there'd be a little nut on the end to hold it in place. There's a handle on the inside, upper left. You were looking at the edge of it, so you don't see the profile of it like we do in the handle above that comes from the outside. So I, I think that though this is the next uh, advancement up, I think both style locks are being made at the same time. You just pay for a very expensive one or you pay for a less expensive one. Next slide. So here we are, we're gonna talk about the ward box sum. So I've highlighted that again, go to the next. Here is a close up view of the ward box that uh, I, I didn't point out in that last, illustration, but I, looking at the book, I could see the pin on this is not actually a T-pin. It's been braised, there's a tenon that's been braised into that P-shaped piece that's riveted to the top of the ward box. Uh, so it's the same form, but it's a different construction. Uh, so here you see a third of the wards towards the top and the, towards the bottom are very similar to the other lock of this style. But in the center, we have a cross-shaped ward that's uh, much more difficult to make. There are three ward plates going across the center of this uh, ward box rather than two, that's on the other one. And uh, you can see where they're fastened on the left-hand side. Uh, the, the leg of this ward box has been cut to fit in those uh, ward plates. You can see the little ward, a wing ward attached to the bottom plate, and you can see one at the top that's attached to the inside uh, base of the ward box. Uh, you do see wards like this sometimes in the simpler type ward boxes that have no bottom plate, but in that case, the ward has to be tenons to the back plate of the lock. So in that case, the, that ward box would have been made by the same smith that made the rest of the lock. Here, I think this he and the ward box would have been made by one smith, and then that would be transferred to another smith that made the lock. Next picture. But this, to give you an idea of cutting the bit of the key to fit wards, this is one that I made with a much simpler ward, uh, but I marked the side of the bit with the key slid over the center pin. And then in the next slide, uh, the first mark is sawed. This is an extra heavy uh, hacksaw blade to, to make a slot big enough to take that ward. The next slide shows cutting the cross ward, uh, cutting, cutting the cleft for the cross ward in the key bit. And the next slide then shows filing to fit. So there's a lot of filing and fitting. When I make a lock with several wards, I'll install one ward and cut and fit the bit of the key to fit that one. And then I'll install the next ward so I know all the places it's binding is in one area. Uh, if it fits the first, if the first cleft fits the first ward, I don't have to go back and file that anymore. Next slide. There's the bit of the key fitting uh, the ward installed in the ward box. But actually, this is a, there's no ward box in this lock. It's installed open in the 
Cat's Paw. Next slide. So here is a, a picture. I wanted you to see all the file work that's done. Every place there's a band or a transition, there are nice little file details, except for on the ward box. The ward box on the outside is very plain, though it's complex on the inside. So the, the bends in the tumblers, the bends on the arm of the tumblers, the bend on the uh, rear staple and the front staple all have file work. You can see the lug that's trapped by the lower tumbler on the lower bolt between the tumbler and the front staple. That, that being indicated there is the lug that's on the bolt. So the bolts are heavy on the outside. They're thinner on the inside. They have, they have this lug that is wider than either part of the bolt. Next slide. This is the back of the lock. All these rivet heads would require the carpenter installing the lock to carve little depressions in the wood so that the lock plate would fit tight against the door. Next slide. So you could see this, this is what you, the key would be approaching as it goes through the door, it would fit over the end of the center pin. And then you have all these wards that you'd have to get around. Now there are um, picks made to, to try to break into locks like this. Uh, but in this case, it, it would be a difficult pick. A lot, a lot of times the center of the pick or a skeleton key is wide open. So you only have to get around the wards on the inside and the outside. But uh, even those would not be straight shots. Next slide. But we're going to talk about the bolts here. So I've reintroduced the illustration with the bolts. Next. You can see at the bottom of the picture the, the angled end of the bolt. And you can see the, the scrolls on the back of the bolts that are used to draw the bolts from the inside. Um, I believe that the, you can see the tumblers in the foreground. I believe the one on the left may have been bent uh, at some time when it wasn't moved out of the way and the door was closed. Uh, the force of that lug against it might have bent it that way. I'm not sure. Uh, that piece has been damaged, but a lot of the other crookedness, I believe, was original to the lock. If it worked, then they weren't all that concerned about getting everything straight and square. If it looked okay and worked, that was considered good. Next slide. The back end shows, you can see the, the scrolls on the bolt that are used as handles. I believe that this uh, other structure that covers the springs is also used to support either the palm of the hand or the thumb when the two bolts are drawn back. Uh, it gives you more uh, leverage to pinch against rather than just to pull on the bolt because the stronger the springs are, the harder it is to pick a lock like this by bending a piece of wire to avoid all the uh, wards in the ward box. Next slide. So this shows, I, I, I videoed making a, a sample bolt. So what I did was using some of the measurements on one of the photographs provided by the Vesterheim, I laid out an illustration of the bolt actual size on a piece of eighth inch thick steel that's thick enough that I could lay hot metal on it and not warp the sheet. I, I drew the scroll and then picked off with a set of dividers every half inch and then laid out what I thought the scroll should look like straight before it's rolled and picked out all I, I picked out the half inch marks and then uh, converted the marks from one to the other. I believe what we have next is the video of making the bolt. I began with a piece of inch by three eighths inch steel and worked it down to seven eighths of an inch, allowing it to get a little bit thicker. And we had talked about speeding this up to, to go through more quickly. Josh? Yeah, do you want it faster? Is this, is this already sped up? Here's 1.5. Okay. So then I. Well, I forged a far side shoulder on the bolt, which may have been behind the pictures on the right, uh, by putting the bringing the hammer down half over the anvil and half over the air, 
beyond the anvil, and that pushes the metal down beyond and compresses it where it's on the anvil. And that's the beginning of the shoulder on the front end of the bolt. Now I'm upsetting that end because I need to have more metal for that little lug. I've quenched the very tip, so I'm upsetting basically just where it's touching the vise. I've got a piece of rounded metal in one vise jaw so that I don't get a shoulder on that side that makes the metal go the other direction. Now I'm upsetting with a butcher, which is uh, has a slight angle on the end, and that pulls metal away. It upsets and separates the metal. You can see it's pulled more metal out from the body. Now I'm going to do a near edge shoulder with the hammer half over the anvil and half over the air. The thin back down to three eighths and leave some material for that lug. Downward. There we go. Now I'm butchering the far side to bring that out even more. And now I need to flatten the top of that to make it look like the old one. A couple times I put it over the hardy hole to straighten the back so I didn't ruin the little lug that's sticking out. Now I'm pressing either side of the lug using a set hammer, which has uh, a nice corner and gives me a uh, a blow that I could never do with the hammer. I still did a little bit of filing afterwards. So there you see the lug on the front and I'm gonna mark where we'll make the shoulder to start the scroll on the back end. Most of this section has been drawn down to uh, about a quarter inch, but uh, it's left a little thicker still back where the scroll is going to be. We could start the second one. So I've marked the soapstone where I want to make a shoulder. Do a far edge shoulder there, thinning what's over the anvil, but leaving the rest wider. And I'm estimating and I'll cut off what I think I'll need for the scroll. Now I'm working this down to uh, a thicker rectangle, flatter in the other dimension, and start the bend. Now we're only showing one out of three heats for a lot of these operations. It makes me look a lot faster. I'm working that bend to a square corner. There's a shoulder on one side. This is one half of a pair. It's not all that hard to make one. It's really difficult to make two that fit next to each other and are mirror images. But there's a shoulder on the outside of each bolt where the skull comes off. There, the corner's getting square. I'm quenching the corner and the end of the section so I can upset the center. By standing it up on end, I'm making it shorter, shorter and thicker. I need enough mass to get that middle of the scroll. Now I'm using the peen of the hammer to spread the metal. And I keep flattening one side and spreading the other edge. Paper the tip, and I'm comparing it to the drawing. Now I'm working on that shoulder at the transition between the scroll and the bolt. 
So it was the final heat there. I've got the shoulder coming all the way to the base of the bolt. Now I'm measuring to see where the make a shoulder to separate that lobe from the tip and then draw the tip out. A near end shoulder to find the lobe. A lot of comparison to the drawing. There was more metal than necessary, which is always better than not having enough. Alternating between the face of the hammer and the beam, the beam draws the metal in one direction better. So after the forging was close, as close as I thought I could get it, I cleaned up the profile with a file. This would be even more critical when you're making two that match each other. And if you're doing two, you have to do at the same time. So you get everything, you match both before you scroll either one. Some of the bending is done using the horn as the fulcrum and some is done by compressing. That bending is compressing. And I believe we have a slide showing the uh, handle laid out on the plate. That's the one. So I, it would have been. Uh, clever to forge the bolt and then trace it to make the drawing, but it doesn't work as well. So this, this was, the drawing was done first and then the bolt was made to match the drawing. The next slide, we're, we'll talk about tumblers again. There they are in red. You can see, again, you can see the, the file work. Uh, I think it's behind the pictures, but this, I was trying to show the lug on the upper a bolt uh, trapped by the tumbler. You can see that the tumblers fit around that little plate that I believe is to protect the fingers. And that's the plate has been given a nice shape and uh, the tumblers fit around that. That's an extension of the front staple. And there's a picture of the, the lug on the lower bolt being trapped by the lower tumbler. You can see the, the pivot on that lower tumbler. You can see the uh, uh, over there on the part of the ward box that shows, you can see some of the grain in that old wrought iron. So here is the uh, Vesterheim's lock being separated. You can see the proximity of the fingers separating the tumblers the, the bolts with those little lugs that would cause a nasty pinch if you didn't have this uh, little protective extension there. Next. Here are the springs. Uh, I'm going to uh, have a video of forging a spring coming up next. This is the spring that, that I made uh, with the square center. The Spring makes uh, a revolution, one and a quarter revolution. So you uh, have four tight corners before, or five tight corners before the spring opens up into the coil. The end of the spring is curved away so it doesn't dig into the metal against which it presses. Okay. So I had a And had a piece of uh, three eighths inch round salvaged coil spring that I flattened. And, and I feel like this was uh, a lot smoother looking in our trial yesterday. 
I can uh, pause it for one second and try one more thing. Hold on a sec, Tom. Is that better for you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is flattening the spring. Now what I want is an even thickness and width so that the spring uh, ends evenly throughout its length. If you have a thin spot, it's gonna bend there more than anywhere else. And when I say even, I mean by eye. I've curled the end of the spring to start the band around the post. And that's a post that is about the size of the post that I'll use in the lock. I'll make the post for the lock to fit the spring when the spring is done. So this is the bend that encloses the post. And I'll make one more bend after this to make sure that the, the square doesn't open up. That's one and a quarter times around the pin. And I'll tighten it some using the edge of the anvil. It cools so quickly if you try to tighten it in vice. The pin tapers slightly to make it easier to remove. Now I'll start the scroll. And I'll push a little bit because I don't want it to bend tight on the pin. I'm pushing forward as I bend it around. And every heat oxidizes some of the steel and you see the scale fall off when you bend it. I'm using the hammer so that I can push and not to undo any of the scroll. So it may have been an advantage just to roll these up quickly and put a cover on them. I, I try to get mine looking neat whether I cover them or not. Any place the spring touches itself reduces the amount of flex. Because that, that any contact becomes a, a fulcrum. I'm using the pliers to tighten the scroll. And you have to do this from both sides, otherwise you, you don't have parallel uh, rings. So the, when, it, when the scrolling was done, the piece was heated and allowed to cool lying on the hearth. Uh, this reduces any of the stress that you put into it by heating different sections and bending it. If you heat the whole thing evenly, I've skipped that. What we're gonna do now is uh, harden. I wanna heat it until just beyond its 
magnetic range. Uh, at the proper temperature for hardening, it will no longer draw to the magnet. But you don't want to go much beyond that because uh, it, the metal will, the quality of the steel will not be as good. But quite often, this is hotter than it. I mean, it's not as hot as it looks in the camera. Now we're, we're at the wrong end of the. We didn't do the. We missed the tempering. I'm finding it for you. That was a <laughs> technical issue here. Hold on one sec. That's the bolt. We were here. So this is right before. Yeah. Okay. So I burned off after quenching in vegetable oil. I heat it again to burn off the oil. It's it's very hard to, to temper the inside of a coil like this, and then this will do it somewhat. But there again, the hardening and tempering is not as critical on a spring this long. I'm, I'm trying not to get the straight part very hot. That that'll temper too quickly, and go too soft. I've burned off the oil that's trapped on the spring and then quenched in water, cleverly hidden behind their pictures on the right. Now I've sanded the straighter stretch and I'm tempering that with the torch so the blue. And this stretch probably hardened more than the rest also, because the, the, the tighter coil didn't get the oil flowing between as well as the, the part that was exposed to more oil. I'm, I'm keeping the torch moving so I don't get any one spot too hot. You can see that Blue coming now, purple and then blue. And I'll quench that in water again also. There's the blue. And always test a spring like this by putting it on posts in the vise and bending it further than it'll ever be bent in the lock to make sure it's not gonna bend or snap. So we have some more slides of forging the front uh, staple, but I thought we'd go back for any questions at this point because we've used up uh, 45 minutes of our hour and we can go back and address any questions on what we have so far. And uh, then we can, I can go through those slides quickly uh, if people would like. And and folks, for your your questions, you can uh, drop them in the chat with uh, a number if you want, or uh, we can spend a few minutes if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. At this point, you can too. And then, of course, we want to be respectful of your time, so we understand if that uh, one o'clock hour hits and you have to go, you have to go. But um, if you want to stick around for the the staple, uh, we'll have that after our question session. Tom, no questions in the chat. Uh, any folks have questions that you want to unmute yourself for? Oh, Kathleen has a question here. It says, <laughs> probably one you get all the time, Tom. How many hours does it take you to make a lock? Everyone is different. Um, I have one here. That... Uh, is a two bolt spring loaded lock, no tumblers. Uh, this took about two weeks. There are some, some smirks from other blacksmiths. I, I take it two weeks is a pretty rapid time to make a lock like that, huh? Any other questions from the audience there? 
All right. If anything comes up, folks, drop in the chat. I'll pull up the staple here, Tom. Josh, Emily is asking, were there types of locks used, were these types of locks used mostly on homes and public buildings? Oh, I, I, I don't know the history as much as I know the construction. Uh, I, I would assume a home. I, I, I think that often the, on public buildings, they were heavier and more showy. Excellent. And there's another question here too. Um, who do you make locks for when, when people commission you to make locks or, or do you just make locks for yourself to explore both? About half the locks I make are for collectors and the other half are being used. Uh, I've been, um, I do, I did, the one that I just held up is on a display board and for that, usually the collectors have a display board like that. And then I sell them without a display board to people that are actually going to use them uh, on a door. And I've got a, a, a potter uh, about 14 miles from here that has a couple of my locks, one on his uh, studio and one on his uh, sales room, along, along with latches that I made. Actually, I made the, the whole door for the studio. And then other times, it's people that are doing uh, uh, I have several locks on colonial style homes in the middle of Wisconsin that are new, newly built that look like old buildings. Here's a question that I like. Uh, it's from Dick uh, Enstead. He says, how many years did it take you to be able to make a lock in two weeks? <laughs> <laughs> Lifetime, right? You know, I, I made my first lock in 1972 and it, I wish I had it because it, it would be kind of funny to see now, but it didn't last. All right, I'm gonna pull up the staples here, Tom. Is that coming up all right for you? Yep, yep, okay, so here's the drawing. Uh, so the staple that I'm gonna forge is like the one on the right, the, the, in red, that has that extension off to the side. Uh, and yeah, it, a modern approach might be to cut this whole thing out of a plate and then bend it up. But uh, from watching Peter Ross working wrought iron, uh, that was not as often the case. That frequently they would start with square and or thicker material and spread parts and uh, draw parts out. That way, uh, if you if you cut this out of wrought iron, you'd have short grain. Uh, on that little tab, and it would be more likely to break off. If you pinch it out of the center of a bigger piece, the grain would follow the shape and it would be stronger. For the next, for, for the first slide, this shows a piece of scrap that I had that I estimated would be enough material to do the project. Uh, it was something under half inch by one inch. And uh, I marked off an inch on the center, so it looks like it might have been just under five inches long to start with. So I heated that up, and in the next slide, you see I, I did a near side, excuse me, a, yeah, a near side shoulder on the far center punch mark. So what will be the uh, extension in the center is to the left of that shoulder, and everything that's narrower on the right will be one leg. Next slide then shows uh, I reversed it and did another near side shoulder and pulled out the other leg. Next slide. But here I've taken both legs and done near side shoulders and forged them down thinner. So they were taken down to uh, somewhere between 3 16th and a quarter inch here. And I used the peen of the hammer that spreads the metal more in, in two directions rather than equally in all directions like the face of the hammer does and stretched the center section out trying to force the metal more in one direction than the other. You can see a little bulge to the back side, but that back side should be uh, straight when the whole thing is done. Next slide. There I used the peen and thinned the whole thing out some more. And the next step then was to make 
two more shoulders and used the flat of the hammer to smooth up the leg. Uh, and this brought it down to about uh, somewhere between an eighth and three sixteenths thick on the legs and thicker on the, the center portion. The next slide shows the beginning of the bend. Uh, it would be easy to put that center portion in the place and get a really crisp square bend on that first leg, but you'd never be able to bend the second leg the same way because, it, because the center is not as wide as the jaw of the vice is, is thick. So I put the leg in and started the bend and did not bend completely 90 degrees because if I had done that, I would not be able to bend the next one as much. I wanted to have the two bends be equal when I finished. So I made that much bend on one and then reversed it to the next slide to make the second bend. And you could see that that uh, thicker center part left me some extra metal where I want my shoulders to be at these bends. So it helped me get a little square or bend by having that thicker metal across the top. So that's all the further I could do in the vise. Then I pinched it on a piece of three quarter inch square. These two bolts are gonna be three eighths inch each. So together they'll be three quarter inch. Pinched it on the three quarter inch square to get the two legs parallel. And then heat it up again and put it on a bar, the next slide. This bar I forged down uh, to be three quarters by seven eighths, which was the, the size I want the uh, bolt ends to be. And there I've hammered on the top that, that drove the metal into those corners to square that up a little bit more. Next slide. Shows that here we are with the three quarter inch bar between the two. And I've driven the bar against a swedge, whatever had a square side on it in the hardy hole, and then flattened the the whole thing against the face of the anvil so that it, it was true in one plane. And so the next slide shows the beginning of the stretching out the that little tab that protects the fingers. So I used the fuller end or the peen of the hammer over this fuller in the anvil that matches that particular hammer to get that convex curve to pull out that little piece of metal some more. Next slide. So here we're starting the bends to make the feet on the legs. So that's, uh, the, I, I clamped the uh, little extension to this bar and then put it in the vise and bent flush with the edge of the bar because this has been worked down to three quarters by seven eighths. The next slide shows the second leg bent. And by driving on the ends of these legs, you can force a little bit more metal into that corner uh, but looking at the, the original uh, lock, you can see that that staple the bends at the feet are more rounded than the bends are at the top where the legs leave the flat at the top. Next slide shows screwing up on the anvil face, getting those two feet in the same plane. Uh, at this point, I decided how uh, much metal I would probably need to do the two little scrolls on the end. So the next slide shows the metal trim. Uh, the one on the right has been scarfed and the one on the left has been rolled up. And then the next slide shows both ends rolled up. Uh, looking at the old the, the lock itself, I, I determined that so you could get a neater groove in that scroll by using a fuller before you rolled the scroll, they had filed it afterwards because the groove didn't come all the way to the inside. So I, I put this in the thicker pickle to take all the scale off, which is harder than the steel underneath, and then did the file work. So the last one is the file. And the, my, my ugly file marks show up a lot more in the photograph than they did in the actual piece. So, this looks like it needs a little more filing before it's called finished, but you could see the little grooves that were filed around the outside to where it, you couldn't file anymore without hitting the uh, feet of the staple. So that's all the filing that was done on the original. And now something I did miss on this, uh, the, the uh, uh, well, we can go to the, the, the lock. Let's, let's go back to the, uh, but it, we can't see it on this picture because we're in the way. Um, 
Is your is it the faces on the side that are in your way, Tom? Right, right. Uh, you you what can... I wanted to see, and then there's a there's a, I don't know what the number is. We do have a plus. But anyhow, there's there's a bevel on the corners of the uh, front staple that was filed in. Uh, generally, because of the way things bend, you get a square corner near the edge than you do in the middle, and so they beveled. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. You can see the bevels. They filed that little bead where the the uh, extension starts, and then they beveled the corners, except for all the way at the outside edge, if you can't see. There they left it square. So the, the, that chamfer stops before the end. It just adds a nice easel. Here you can see on the upper side, you can see that that little bit of file work on the skull ends as it approaches the lower side of the skull. I believe that's it then. That's it. And um, there's a, a few questions here for you, Tom. One of sure. them is, uh, da, 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 where'd it go? Uh, when you were making the last staple, was that wrought iron? That was not. No, that was just a scrap of steel. It would have been interesting to do it, to do it in wrought iron. All right. Any other questions on that last staple, folks? You just wowed them all, Tom. 